Hello, and thank you for tuning in to The Christian Skeptic. I'm your host, Sean Kerwin, and as always, it's my mission to take an honest look at our questions about Christianity through the lens of logic and reason. I'm not here to preach at you, just to start a conversation with you. I hope you enjoy the show. So I don't know why I've never recorded an episode like this or an episode on this subject. As a matter of fact, I was going back through my archived episodes because I wasn't sure if I'd recorded something like this or not. And so I just did a quick uh, search for my titles and I just typed in Jesus in the search box and realized I've actually never recorded an episode with Jesus in the title. So here we go. Is Jesus God? Like... The gravity of that question, especially if you call yourself a Christian, should hit you. Because if the answer is no, everything falls apart, right? Like, it's it's funny. I was getting coffee with a neighbor uh, the week before last, and we were talking about religion. And he's not a Christian. And so, and I love his perspective because he's like super into philosophy. And, and we read a lot of the same books. And so it's really cool to talk about these things. And he was espousing the typical cultural idea that all religions are created equal, more or less, right? That every religion has redeemable qualities about it, and you can kind of take pieces from every religion, take pieces from every culture, and become this Americanized cultural hodgepodge of religion and live a really beautiful, fulfilling life. And I was like, yeah, no, that sounds like really beautiful and profound and uh, like something that on the surface level seems wonderful and seems like you're a a humanitarian kind person until you get to christianity and it gets to this jesus person like he kind of throws a wrench into the whole thing and so with that i guess we have to look at who is jesus and i think i can fit this all in one episode but we'll see how it goes and and it's weird looking at who is jesus right because we have his words the words that i mean are at least attributed to him right the words that are spoken about him by his friends, we'll call them the disciples, the prophecy that is attributed to him, and then the titles that are given to him by kind of all three, right? He gives himself titles, his friends give him titles, and then prophets give him titles. And then we have what the rest of history in the world says, and sometimes it's different. There's there's a lot of different things to say about Jesus, right? And so to get it out of the way, I'm going to start with the Orthodox Christian Doctrine, And this, I'm just going to read a a quote because I can't say it better than Dr. Norman Geisler, uh, one of the last century's most famous apologists, late um, apologists. He says, Orthodox Christianity claims that Jesus of Nazareth was God in human flesh. This doctrine is absolutely essential to true Christianity. If it is true, then Christianity is unique and authoritative to other theistic religions, namely Judaism and Islam. If not then Christianity does not differ in kind from them, but only in degree. And this hinges this argument on Christianity. And I realize this podcast is getting released in December as we approach Christmas. And Jesus is on kind of the back burner or forefront of everyone's minds. He's he's around this, this season that we call Advent to some degree, more or less. And this becomes very difficult because of what he said. First and foremost, the gospel is that we can only be saved through the forgiveness of sins on the cross, through the death of Jesus Christ, and only by believing in him, and that that salvation is not of works, right? There's there's no religious activity or amount of being a good person that can save. And so right there, we have kind of the, the first fundamental pitfall of Christianity, where if Jesus isn't God, and that falls through that changes everything, right? Then being a good person is of infinite, eternal importance. Or bowing down to another God is of infinite, eternal importance. Or maybe there is no God, right? And so, and that makes it hard. And so just a, a few examples of, of what Jesus said. In John 8, verse 46, Jesus said he was without sin. In John 8, verse 58, he says that he always existed. In John chapter 3, verse 16, 
It's claimed that Jesus is the Son of God. In John chapter 8, verse 12, he says he's the light of the world. In John chapter 3, verse 17, he said he came to save the world. In Mark chapter 2, verse 10, he says he has authority to forgive sins. In John chapter 18, verse 37, he said he was born to testify of the truth. In John chapter 14, verse 1, he says, you trust in God, don't you? Trust also in me, or likewise, or the same trust in me. In John chapter 14, verse 6, he says, I am the truth and the only way to get to God the Father. In Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 46, he lays out this story of how he will come again to judge the sins of the world. And so I think maybe even before we get to, I guess, the validity of these truth claims, um, C.S. Lewis points something out in Mere Christianity that I think is important to bring up at this point in time, and that's just the context of the culture, right? Jesus is saying these words 2,000 years ago to a Jewish audience. And so Lewis writes, this comes as a real shock. And I quote from Mere Christianity, among the Jews, there suddenly turns up a man who goes on talking as if he was God. He claims to forgive sins. He claims he always existed. He says he's coming to judge the world at the end of time. Now let us get this clear. Among pantheists, like the Indians, anyone might say that he was a part of God or one with God. There would be nothing very odd about it. But this man, since he was a Jew, could not mean that kind of God. God in their language meant the being outside of the world who made it and was infinitely different from everything else. And when you have grasped that, you will see that what this man said was quite simply the most shocking thing that has ever been uttered by human lips. And I don't think that's an exaggeration for C.S. Lewis. I think he understands the culture of the time, right? He understands the deep Jewish religion. And keep in mind, all of the disciples were Jewish. All of the writers that wrote these things that Jesus said were born Jewish. They were raised in Judaism. They were raised knowing that anyone who makes an image, anyone who claims to have an image, and especially anyone who claims to be an image of the God so pure and perfect and holy that even Moses couldn't look on him, is a blasphemer. And yet Matthew, Levi, the tax collector, records that Jesus is the one who fulfilled the prophecy, saying they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. John says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word, just a few verses later, says, became flesh and made his dwelling among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, that no one has ever seen, God. John records Thomas in chapter 20, verse 28, saying to Jesus, you are my Lord and my God. Paul, not one of the apostles, but the later converted to Christianity would record in Colossians that in Christ, all the fullness of the Godhead lives in bodily form, that the appearing of our great God and Savior was fulfilled in Jesus, he writes in Titus chapter 2. And then there's the prophecies that Jesus takes on for himself. So as I just mentioned, he takes on this Emmanuel name, this God with us name, but he also takes on the name of God, that Yahweh name that's referred to, right? That's That comes from Exodus chapter 3, where Moses is going back into Egypt, and God is sending him, and Moses is like, who should I say sent me? And God gives his name, and his name is I am that I am, right? It's that Yahweh that is thrown around. It's, it's the sacred, holy, only name of God that can only be attributed to God, and we know that from Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 39, and also from Isaiah 43, verse 10. And then Jesus says in John chapter 8, before Moses was, I am. And, and that's crazy because what that means is, as I just alluded to with John's reference of in the beginning was the word, that's Genesis chapter 2, right? That is, that is God giving life. Well, that's also John chapter 5, where Jesus says to be the giver of life, and John chapter 10, and John chapter 11. So if Jesus is the giver of life, well, it would also make sense then in Matthew chapter 18 and Matthew chapter 28, where he claims to be omnipresent, as well as Matthew chapter 11, Luke chapter 5, John chapter 2, 16, and 21, where he claims to be omniscient or all-knowing. 
Similarly, in Matthew chapter 28, Mark chapter 21, and John chapter 10, he claims to be omnipotent. And so now we're kind of touching on something that we get from the Talmud and the Torah, right? From, from Jewish scholars, they write, and, and Christian scholars and theologians have picked this up as well, but there are five non-transferable attributes of God. So in other words, there are five attributes that can only be placed on what you would define as God in the truest, most uh, Torah, biblical, Jewish, uh, and including Islamic sense of the, of the word. So, and, and I don't have time to really dive into these, and maybe we can do that in a future episode, but those five are, number one, aseity, which is self-existence, which is to say that outside of time, outside of creation, outside of everything, the, the first principle of causality exists in God, that God is neither created nor can be destroyed, right? God exists outside of creation in and of himself. So that's one of the attributes of God. The other one is sovereignty, right? Or, or as I just mentioned, omnipotence, which is that all-powerful quality. Then in Islam, Judaism, and Christianity, the God, creator God, has power and dominion over everything, right? There's nothing God cannot do with his power. Also, infinity is one of those five attributes. So it's a limitlessness not like the weird Bradley Cooper movie, um, <laughs> or as I just mentioned previously, omnipresence. And so what that is saying then in Christianity, Islam, and Judaism is that God is everywhere, right? Not that God is in everything, as Lewis mentioned in the quote that I just read to you, but that God is everywhere, that God is surrounding everything. And then there is immutability, and uh, if you've been listening for a while, you know that I recorded an episode <laughs> asking, does God change his mind? Where I actually do go into this one quite a bit, but that's, that's just that. That's unchangeability. So for Christianity, Islam, Judaism, God does not change. He is the same as the Bible says yesterday, today, and forever. Speaking of forever, the fifth non-transferable attribute of God is eternality. So God is timeless, right? As I just mentioned, he has no beginning or end, or as... Jesus claims in Revelation, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And so if we go back, all of the references I just made is Jesus claiming all of those attributes for himself. With, to the Jewish listener, the most shocking of which being Jesus saying, before Abraham was, I am. Making reference to the name of God that was given at the time that God was only referred to as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jesus says before that, before the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob said to Moses, I am, Jesus says, I am. So, okay, <laughs> maybe Jesus is God. But what does that mean? Well, we're only actually looking at half the picture because Jesus was also man. And that's probably the worst part of things <laughs> from a uh, human nature sin perspective. And I'll say why on, on that in a second, but I think it's also important to note that the Bible talks about a divine and a human nature equally for Jesus. So I just mentioned all of those references, um, and, I, and feel free to rewind, go back and look those up for yourself. But the Bible also makes references to Jesus' human nature. And so before we get to why that's important, Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 says that Jesus was born of a woman, born under the law. Luke chapter 2, verse 52 shows that Jesus grew up just like every other Hebrew child attending the festivals, going to the temple. Matthew chapter 4 verse 4 shows that Jesus was hungry like a man. John chapter 19 verse 28 shows Jesus was thirsty like a man. John chapter 4 verse 6 shows that Jesus was tired. He, he, he grew weary. He needed sleep. He was exhausted at the end of the day. John chapter 11 verse 33 shows that Jesus had friends and he cared and he hurt and, and he, he got sad and he cried. John 19 shows the suffering of Jesus, very real, hurtful, painful human suffering, as well as the death. He was buried at the end of the chapter. Later, Paul, well, at least a lot of scholars attribute <laughs> the author of Hebrews to be Paul. It might not be Paul, but the author of Hebrews, which may or may not be Paul, writes later that he was human <clears throat> in every sense that we are human, and yet he was without sin. 
in the fourth chapter in the 15th verse of Hebrews is where I get that reference from. And so where do we go with this? Well, Philippians 2, verse 6 through 7, Paul writes, Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And so the concept is weird, and it doesn't quite make sense, because now we're, we have to look back at this trinity nature of God, who at the time that Jesus was on the earth, God was in heaven, the Father, God was in spirit, the Holy Spirit, and then God was on earth, the Son, and there was distance between them. It's it's like, it's, it's three who's, right? God the Father who, God the Son who, number two, and God the Spirit who, number three. And it's one what. The what, the overarching definition, is God of the three who's. Does that even make sense? I don't know. I mean, it, it doesn't, right? Like, it's hard to comprehend in our human mind. And then to make matters even weirder, there's this picture in the Gospels where Jesus gets baptized, and Jesus is standing there in the water, heaven opens, God the Father speaks, and you see the Spirit descending like a dove, which is also kind of weird, because as Dr. Timothy Keller points out, there's really only one other place in all of Jewish tradition that the Holy Spirit's referred to as a dove, and that's one of the translations from the captivity of the Torah, where it, when it says the Spirit was hovering over the waters of the deep, it uses a word that's kind of like fluttering, but that word in context was only used to describe a dove, and so that's also kind of weird that it's like, okay, now here we are, Jewish context, Jesus is there getting baptized, there's clearly a three who's, but it's all God happening in this scene. And then there's this offhanded, like, demonstrative, I guess, interpretive dance kind of reference to the creation story. And, and all of this somehow coalesces and concludes on this baptism of Jesus. And God the Father speaks to God the Son while God the Holy Spirit is descending on Jesus and says, This is my beloved Son in who I am well pleased. It doesn't make sense. Then we look at these words, and then we look at history, and then we look at Josephus and Pliny the Younger, and then we look at everything that's happened in the past 2,000 years, and clearly this Christianity has completely changed the world, and clearly there was a person who lived on this earth named Jesus. And so then it's like, okay, well, all of the verses I just referenced about Jesus being a human in the Bible, well, it's plausible then that those are true. And so we're still left wondering, what if everything he said was true? Right, because if everything, if if half of what he said wasn't true, well, then let's throw the baby out with the bathwater. Like, like for real though, and I'm not, I'm not trying to be smart alecky here, but if, if half of what Jesus said wasn't true, don't follow him. Celebrate something else this Christmas, right? Like, 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 like for real though. Like, and 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 I'm wrestling with this thought just as much as you are. I, maybe, maybe I'm wrestling with it more than you are. I don't know. I, I feel like I always wrestle with this thought. I feel like this is the the whole point and culmination of my skepticism is I always got to know if it can be disproven. Because if it's true, if Jesus is God, then that means that his death on the cross does pay for sins, right? If if that's true, if Jesus is God, that means he rose from the dead. If Jesus rose from the dead and forgave sins, then there's no other way besides Christianity. There's no other way to live life. There's no other way to get to heaven. There's no other way to God. There's no other way to peace besides Christianity if this is all true. And I'll be honest with you guys, at this moment right now, and for the past decade of my life, I have believed and still believe this is true. Look, because the reality is, when you get back to the Trinity, when you get back to what C.S. Lewis writes, when you get back to what we know about psychology, when you get back to what we know about evolution, when you get back to what we know about biology, nothing else connects the puzzle pieces together quite like the statement, Jesus is God. And I hope I've been building this case and making this case for you over the course of the past couple of years that I've been doing this podcast and, and you've been tuning in, or maybe you're just starting to listen. And, and I encourage you to go back and listen because I have a lot more to say on this, but I've done a lot of reading. <laughs> I've, I've read other religious texts. I'm skeptical. I'm hunting. I'm searching. And I would be lying to you if I said I found anything that disproves the deity of Christ as much as it would be a temptation of mine to do. But, and like, seriously, though, I love reactions. I love shocking people. And so I would love to record a podcast episode where I just shock you and say, hey, the Christian skeptic is no longer a Christian, and here's the reason why. And part of that reality is there can't just be one simple reason. The, the conversation on is there a God is complex enough. And I think I've reasoned through that enough to not get into it here. I mean, obviously, we're running so much out of time right now. But if we say there's a God, then we have to answer which God is that God. 
And I think we have to take human psychology into consideration when we do that. I think we have to take where we are in biology, whether you believe in evolution or not. But, but you know, if you do believe in evolution, we have to look at what all we've been through on an evolutionary basis and how we've evolved over time and, and what the culmination of this is. And go back to the evolution episode I recorded. But if it's a process, structuralism, evolution, and, and the, the, the pinnacle point that we're reaching is this human intellect, and we know that there are certain things that help it thrive, like community and belonging and love and authenticity and speaking the truth, and these are all basic human psychological concepts, wouldn't it make sense that if there's a God, he fulfill those things for us in the deepest, most truest, and most eternal sense? And what God does that, who sits up in heaven and says, you obey, you do good, you be a good person, and, and if you fail, I'm going to punish you for the rest of eternity. And, and if you succeed and you're good enough, and, and, and maybe you have to be better than everybody else, maybe then I'll love you. What kind of God is that other than a cruel God who delights in power, and I don't think it's just wish fulfillment to say that a God who loves us so much that he would say, you're imperfect, you can't do this, there's a standard, there's righteousness, there's justice, you know it, I've embedded it in your heart, and that's why you can look at any tragedy, almost almost every human being on this planet can look at a tragedy, can look at unjust behavior, can look at something unfair, can look at a life taken too soon, can look at, at, at a life ruined too quickly and say, that's not right, that's not fair, I wish life was better. And we all have some general sense of meaning, and, 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 and it's not wish fulfillment to say that there's a God who says all of that and then says, you're too weak to meet that standard. You're too weak to save the world. You're too weak to save even yourself. So I'll come do it. I'll come save you. I'll come pay the price. I'll come bear the fullness of unjust treatment, of unfair, the fullness of the weight of the law and the punishment that you deserve. And I will bring justice to that. And that the only form of justice is generous justice and that that's how the universe is going to be made right. I don't think it's wish fulfillment to believe in that because I think that some things are so true that we know the alternative is hell. But I don't know. Thus, we continue to engage in this dialogue. Thus, I continue to encourage you. Email me. Reach out. Let me know what you think. And if I don't get to talk to you before then, I hope you do have a good Christmas and I hope you've enjoyed the show.